Um, so welcome everyone, welcome to today's seminar. Uh, this is the last talk of this uh, four episode series of seminars that CMCC has organized on the Arctic system and its predictability. And it's a great pleasure to welcome and um, introduce today's speaker, Edward Blanchard Vogelsworth from the University of Washington who will present um, his talk towards operational CIS forecasts, challenges and opportunities. So thank you, Edward, for accepting our invitation to be with us today um, and for taking the time to share your knowledge and experience, and experience on this topic with us. So I'd like to say a few more words about our speakers. So Edward is a research assistant professor in the Department of Atmospheric, Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Washington, where he specializes in the interactions between sea ice, the atmosphere, and the ocean on Arctic sea ice predictability across different timescales and on the role of snow in the Arctic climate system. Um, he's received his um, undergraduate degree from Cambridge University and a master's in polar science and meteorology at the Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge. He then moved to the University of Washington to complete his PhD in atmospheric sciences with a focus on sea ice predictability. He's also been visiting research associates uh, in several institutes, including the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, and at the Catalan Institute for Climate Science in Barcelona. I'd also like to add that uh, Edward has been um, chair in the, uh, for the American Meteorological Society Committee for Polar Meteorology and Oceanography. And since 2017, he has been a member of NASA Operation Icebridge, which aims to um, monitor, help monitoring sea ice and polar regions. And last but not least, since 2013, he has been a, a leadership team member of the Sea Ice Prediction Network, which he will tell us more about today. So um, thank you again for being with us. And before I leave the floor to you, I'll just quickly present a few slides on CMCC for those in the audience who may not be familiar with our organization. Okay, so um, CMCC uh, stands for the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change, and it's a research organization that was established in 2005 to then become a foundation in 2015. The mission of CMCC is to investigate and model our climate system and its interactions to develop uh, science-driven uh, strategy, strategies and policies for climate change adaptation and mitigation and promote sustainable growth. The network is organized, uh, sorry, the center is organized in the form of a network with different locations distributed across the country. So the headquarters are located in Lecce in the south of Italy, which is also home to our supercomputing facilities. Uh, but there's centers also located in Caserta, Sassari in Sardinia, Viterbo, Bologna, Milan, and Venice. And as well as this internal network of locations, CMCC also benefits from external collaborations with other research centers and universities and other institutional partners. So there is a total of 11 research divisions at CMCC, uh, which share different knowledge and skills related to climate science and climate change. So we'll not read each one of them now, but if you'd like to find out more, you can uh, check out our website where you can find all the information about CMCC and also about each one of these individual research divisions. So as you can imagine, the, um, because of this large number of divisions, the, the range of topics that are covered by um, CMCC researchers is very broad. So we go from the more physical science aspects of, of climate change um, that include numerical modeling and simulation and predictions, uh, climate predictions across different timescales, and also um, ocean modeling and data simulation, but also um, uh, analysis and assessment of climate risk and climate impacts on society, economy, uh, ecosystem services, and, and so on, all the way to global climate policy. Finally, um, the way CMCC uh, contributes to the wider scientific community happens on many levels. So um, mainly through pub publication of scientific articles for um, international peer-reviewed journals, but 
also through communication events like the, the webinar you're attending now and other types of communication and outreach events that um, aim to uh, communicate our science to the general public. And finally, CMCC is also involved in several educational programs, including different um, PhD programs. Okay, so before I conclude this introduction, I just have a couple of reminders for the seminar. So your audio and video have been deactivated by default when you entered the Zoom call um, and will remain deactivated throughout the duration of Edward's talk. But if you need to intervene and ask questions, which you're um, encouraged to do, uh, you can do so in the uh, question and answer session that we'll have at the end of the talk. And you have two, essentially two ways to, to take part to this. The first one is to um, write your questions um, in the dedicated Q&A chat that you see at the bottom of the screen. Or alternatively, you can also use the raise hand feature and in this case, if you wish to do so, at the end of the talk, we will unmute your microphone so you can direct your questions um, to Edward directly. Okay, I'd also like to remind you that this webinar will be recorded and will also be uploaded on, C on the CMCC YouTube channel. Um, if you have any questions about this or about the webinar in general, you can direct your queries to webinar at cmcc.it. And don't forget to follow us on social media. Okay, so I will now um, stop sharing my screen and I will um, switch off my microphone and um, video. So Edward, the floor is yours. And thank you so much again for being with us today. You can share your screen and I look forward to your talk. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Elena, uh, for such a kind introduction and thank you to CMCC and Stefano for uh, allowing me the opportunity to, uh, to speak and, and for the invitation. And uh, I'm sorry I had to cancel uh, a few weeks ago. Um, so thanks for uh, coming back. Um, so th this is the title of my talk. And um, um, I, I know that this is the fourth uh, talk in this seminar kind of series about CI's predictability. And um, I know that uh, Marika Holland and Mitch Bushuk uh, kind of showed some, maybe some of the more uh, theoretical aspects of CS predictability. And today, uh, I want to focus mostly on sort of the operational uh, side of things and where the community of CIS forecasting is um, at the moment, what challenges we're kind of finding and what opportunities there might be for uh, future, uh, both future research and, uh, and the production of these uh, CIS forecasts. Um, so uh, let me... I don't know if you can see that. Uh, so a little bit of a brief outline. Um, I, I do want to uh, touch on some of these results from um, uh, the theoretical uh, studies of CS predictability and, and retrospective forecasts. And a little bit later, how those results lay the foundation uh, for producing real world, uh, real time forecasts of CIs. Um, and I'll talk about the uh, the Kind of the main efforts uh, that are going on in CIS forecasting. Um, I'll talk about the CIS prediction network and, and the CIS outlook. Um, I'll describe how much skill these um, efforts are having and how that skill compares with the uh, potential uh, or the theoretical limit of predictability and what might be the, the role of both initial conditions and model physics in, in understanding this difference uh, or the potential gap uh, between um, between skill. Um, ah, okay. Uh, so um, uh, a little bit of uh, kind of uh, a one slide summary of results from the studies of um, where we've used perfect models to uh, study the um, theoretical limits of CIS predictability. And as I said, I'm pretty. I, I know that Marika and Mitch, I think, discussed this um, in uh, in more detail, but. One of the main results from these studies is that um, it, they've been very useful to understand the kind of lead times at which we believe there should be skill of CIS forecast. And a lot of these studies show that uh, for at least seasonal, and in some cases, maybe one year, two years, there should be skill of um, uh, CIS forecast in terms of initial value predictability. And then you normally have a, a time window or a, or a gap at the annual time scale where there's no skill in forecasts. 
And then at longer time scales, uh, decadal time scales, you start to have uh, skill from force predictability. This is from regulative forcing. Um, so that, that's more like a climate uh, forecast, you know, decades in advance. Um, and we know uh, basically the difference between the two is it's quite, um, it's quite important, uh, the initial value predictability. And I'm using uh, Edward Lawrence's terminology uh, from 50 years ago, um, sort of uh, describing these two um, sources of predictability, where your initial value, the skill depends on the quality of your initial conditions and then the model physics. So how well you know the physics that simulates uh, how those initial conditions evolve in time. Uh, whereas your forced skill, um, the, the, that skill depends uh, more on how, how well you can uh, simulate or predict future climate change and then the right sea ice response uh, to that uh, future climate change. And so when you look at the time series of uh, sea ice extent, uh, and I'm showing here the September monthly average sea ice extent from 1979 to 2021, this is, where, this is what we call the satellite era. So we have uh, pretty very good, um, or pretty good observations of sea ice concentration that we can make this time series. And th this is a little bit of a poster child of climate change because it shows this very strong reduction in sea ice extent um, over the last 42 years. Um, but superimposed on that trend, you can see that there's a lot of interannual variation. Um, and actually, uh, you know, some years can be negative with respect to the trend line, uh, which is shown in blue. And then the next year can be positive uh, with respect to that trend line, right? So when we think about uh, the seasonal forecast, what we want to forecast is the evolution of, um, of this time series about the, the, that trend line. Uh, from one year to the next, or, or at least from, say, spring to summer, uh, whereas the, you know, the climate, uh, that decadal predictability would be more if in the 80s or 90s, you know, to predict kind of the trend or where would be during this decade. Um, so what I want to talk about is more of this short term, the seasonal forecasting uh, problem or, or aspect of a CS predictability. So um, when so I mentioned a very briefly the results from the um, perfect models. Uh, so when we use a model to forecast itself, and um, you get, we can also look back at uh, retrospective forecasts. So I know many operational centers to quantify the skill in the systems. They make these re uh, retrospective forecasts, also called hindcasts. And there's been quite a few studies in the last uh, during the last decade. That have done that uh, have done this with sea ice, and they all show some level of skill in seasonal forecast of summer or September sea ice extent. And that this is kind of the main message from these results. And for example, this is from Mathieu Chevalier. This is using the Meteor France model, and he looked at he he made retrospective forecasts from 1990 to 2008 of September sea ice extent. And th these are initialized on May 1st, so that's a, a lead. Uh, five, five month lead. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, uh, about a five month lead forecast of uh, September CIS extent, and he got a correlation of 0.6, uh, which is significant. It's it's not huge, but it's definitely skillful. And then a few other studies um, I show here the anomaly correlation coefficient uh, in three different studies that use uh, three different uh, uh, models to forecast CIS extent, and along the uh, x-axis in the two panels on the left, this is the, the target month that you're predicting. And along the y-axis, this is the lead, uh, like, like what month you start in the prediction. So you can see that, um, you, you know, a, a sort of lead zero would be to predict September uh, or the monthly September mean on September 1st or from the end of August. And as you go up the y-axis, you, you're going back further in time and you can see that uh, you know, shorter leads have higher skills. But what I do want to bring your attention is that if you look at September, normally the skill in these systems, uh, you, know, you can see skill up to leads three, uh, three about four. Uh, Rim Mazdek, uh, Mazdek, Mazdek's um, study with uh, the GFDL model, uh, uh, this is slightly harder to read because the lead goes from uh, right to left rather than top to down. But you can see if you look at September here, um, and you go uh, up the lead time, uh, this skill here for about uh, six months uh, prior to September. 
So um, the one of the main current efforts in real time CIS forecasting, it, it's called the CIS Outlook. And this is a product of the CIS Prediction Network. Uh, I have the website here uh, that you can look at. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it. And uh, since th this was started in 2008, um, and it was a little bit motivated actually in 2000 by the really big minimum in 2007. Uh, September 2007 was that first really negative record in the CIS extent. And um, a group of CIS scientists got together that winter following September 2007 and thought, well, are these sort of changes predictable? Uh, let's start an effort. And uh, since 2008, this has been a community led uh, sort of uh, effort where we, we invite forecasts from pretty much everyone. Uh, we're very democratic um, and we organize forecasts uh, at three different times. One is early June, early July, and early August. So these are about you know, the seasonal lead that, that we should have skill at from these previous studies. And uh, what was um, what we, a new thing we did in 2021, we also invited an early September forecast. So th this is quite a short time uh, lead, um, uh, sh short lead time. And we have uh, many types of forecasts. We have uh, from dynamical models, uh, from statistical, uh, what we call heuristic, and also and even public polls. Um, uh, and, and these have been, the traditional forecast has been just September CIS extent. So that would be one number per, per forecast of, uh, you know, the, the extent in the forecast. And, but we've also included over the last few years, spatial forecasts, and, and I'll show that a bit later because there's much recognition from say stakeholders that while well, one number, you know, for the whole Arctic, it, it's a bit simple and, and a lot of stakeholders want to have more detailed regional information. Uh, there's also other data sets that have been uh, that are available for CIS forecast. Uh, uh, one that's been um, studied as the uh, the seasonal to se uh, sub seasonal to seasonal forecast um, uh, group, uh, and there's a couple of studies that uh, I'll show some results later from. Um, okay, so what does the main? Uh, oh, so uh, I just want to show here the um, how we've how this has grown since 2008. So. This is the number of forecasts per year. Um, so the total number of forecasts we get in those three or four months in June, July, and August uh, per year. And you can see that in 2008, we were at about 80 forecasts. And over the last six years, we get at least 100 forecasts every summer. So it's, it's been growing. And the other information on this figure is the type of forecast. And you can see that over the last, um, uh, especially over the last, uh, over the second half, it's mostly, most of the forecasts are either statistical or dynamical. And we have included a subtype uh, in the last few years of uh, forecasts produced by machine learning um, models, which is still a, a type of statistical model. Um, but, you know, th there's been quite a bit of, um, of hype on machine learning. So we, we've kind of given them their own category. Um, so you can see that most of our forecasts are coming from either statistical or dynamical models. And this is the sort of figure that we produce. Uh, so this is, for example, uh, figure one in the in the June 2021 outlook this year. And uh, each each bar or each um, it's each, each sort of value that's associated with the forecast that is the uh, the forecast of the September case extent that each of these groups uh, has offered, and they are color coded by methodology. Um, you can see the legend on the right. And uh, there's, there's sort of a couple of messages here, right? One is that we, we do get a lot of forecasts, right? It's about 30, 30 35 uh, or so, um, uh, 35 to 40 per month at the moment. And uh, it's, it's very international. Um, so we get a lot from North America, but also from Europe and, and Asia. Um, and uh, the other message is that there's a really big spread in these forecasts, right? So. For example, in, in June 2021, the lower forecast were predicting below 4 million square kilometers, so about 3.6, uh, which would have been the second lowest on record. And then the highest ones are above 5 million square kilometers, uh, which would have been one of the higher values in the last 15 or, or 13 years. Um, and, um, and you can also see that there doesn't seem, at least in this year, there's there's no clustering by methodology, right? There's kind of a mix of colors 
uh, the green um, and the salmon. And so, um, so we see that, you know, this spread across forecast is, is common to single methodologies of the forecast too. Now, one of the issues with this spread is that if I, uh, I show you here at the bottom, this is uh, about half a million square kilometers is the, the standard deviation of, C of September CX extent when you detrend the forecast, right? And so you can see that there's quite a few sigma, uh, quite a few standard deviations difference between the low and the high forecast. And that's, that's a concerning. So it's a little bit like, you know, if you had a weather forecast of temperature and some forecasts were cold and others were warm, right? And you had several standard deviations difference across the forecast. And this is something I'll, I'll discuss later, uh, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's a fairly persistent issue, right? It's not just June, 2021. We've seen this every year for every forecast that there's a, there's a big range across different models. Okay, so how well are we doing? Uh, this is a time series uh, from 2008 to 2021. And in black, I show you the observed uh, September sea ice extent uh, in that time. Um, so this is a, a subset of that time series I showed earlier. And um, the more kind of um, light brown color is a range of forecasts with the, the squares, uh, the red squares, that's the, the median forecast from all the forecasts. And basically, uh, if, if, if you look at this and visually you think, oh, there's not very much skill, that's correct. Um, so we've quantified the skill of this, uh, and I'll show that in a little bit, but basically it's, it's only a little bit better than, than a persistence or, or like a linear trend forecast, right? If you just forecast that linear trend every year, um, we only do a little bit better. And you can see that the big, you know, the big, uh, the years where there's a big change, like 2012 or 2013, um, or even this current year, 2021, right? Um, we're, we're missing those years. Um, so um, this is this is kind of one of the early results that there's, there's limited skill, um, at least when you look at the whole uh, CIS outlook forecasts. Uh, and um, a few years ago, uh, we wrote a paper where we quantified a little bit better uh, the forecast skill. So what I show you in this figure, these are the root mean square errors in the sea ice um, extent forecast in uh, millions of square kilometers. Um, and uh, along the x-axis are the different initializations. Um, uh, so May, I see that this would be like a May 1st initialization, June 1st, July 1st, August 1st, uh, all of these of September sea ice extent forecast, right? So the closer you are to zero, the better the skill, uh, the further away were skill. And I show you different, um, I've plotted here values from different results. So the squares here, those are the skills, um, the forecast skills in these perfect model studies. The circles are the ones from the hindcasts that I showed before. So those are real world forecasts but of the past. Um, this black square, that is a damped anomaly persistence forecast. Um, so sea ice extent has a, uh, has a decorrelation time scale of a few months. So to use a, a simple statistical methodology based on persistence or damp persistence can give you some skill for a couple of months. And then the either the red or light um, sort of pink colors here, these are from the sea ice outlook. Um, so the, the dark red, that's when you use the multimodal mean. Uh, so when you take all the sea ice outlook forecast and you make a, uh, and that, and you use that. Um, and then the light uh, pink here is using every single forecast, right? So you can see that, um, uh, yeah, there's, there's very limited skill and the, uh, the climatology, or if you did it just a climatological forecast, uh, this would be the um, kind of the, this straight uh, black line. Um, so it's, yeah, so we're not doing uh, spectacularly and, uh, you can see there's an improvement of skill from June to August, as you'd expect, as the lead time gets shorter, but it's still uh, it's still quite limited. Um, so um, as one of the results come to find. And uh, I, I want to discuss a little bit more uh, this year's uh, 2021 um, efforts, um, especially because for the first time we invited people to submit a September uh, forecast um, in early September of September itself. So, you know, we've had this problem in the past of, you know, there's a really big forecast uh, range across all the different forecasts. 
and there's not much skill uh, by August, but you know, would they get much better by September? And what I show you here in each month uh, along the x-axis, uh, e each of those uh, initializations, uh, these are again, all forecasts of September sea ice extent and in the, um, along the y-axis, the, the gray line, this is the observation. This is, uh, so this is the 2021 observed sea ice, um, September sea ice extent, it's about 4.91, 4.92. And, and you can see that yeah, the, the models, the forecasts do get closer to this observed value. They, you can see that the values increase. Um, but even by September, uh, you still have a really big spread across all the forecasts. And, and a lot of these forecasts are still really low, right? They're, they're quite far away from 4.92. Um, interestingly, um, we don't see much difference between the three methodologies, although it, it does seem that maybe from August to September, the the statistic, uh, the machine learning uh, models do show a, li a little bit more improvement from August. But I, I want to focus focus a little bit on the September uh, result because um, because we, we it was a bit surprising to us that even at that short of a lead time, there was still you know there's not much skill and and a lot of spread. So um one way to very simply kind of look at this is that um uh we requested these forecasts by the uh 10th of september so this is in in american so month and day um so what i've just done here it's a, it's a very simple sort of uh projection and what i've done is if you take the ca extent on august 1st uh, oh, sorry august 31st 2021 uh, which is about 5.2 million square kilometers and you just uh, to that number, you just add all the historical tendencies uh, from the last uh, 35 years uh, of CS extent. Um, so the, these are sort of past e evolutions throughout the month of September, just added to, to the observed value on August 31st. And you get this sort of plume of, uh, of potential trajectories, right? The, this is what we, what we could consider given the past, like analogs, sort of uh, unexpected September value if, if you know what, where you were on August 31st. And, and these, are, these would be sort of the expected uh, family of, of, of grouping of possible values. And you go from about 4.8 to 5.4. And, and most of them, through, this is the interquartile range, they, they group in the low 5 million square kilometers, right? So on, on August 31st, we would have known, okay, this is sort of my range of possible values. Um, and, uh, and these are here, the, the forecasts that were uh, submitted in September, right? So a lot of them are just, um, you, you know, really far out from sort of any historical um, expectation, right? And so we don't really understand why the contributions of why the forecasts are, are doing this, um, even at such a short lead time. And this is definitely both a challenge and, and an opportunity and understanding uh, this better. Um, so overall, uh, I've shown you that the CS out of forecast, they, they show little skill in, in the summer forecast, September sea extent, that there is this very large spread across forecast, which is ge general, uh, generally also a sign of a system with low skill. And, um, and that even at these short leads times, the, these problems seem to persist. Um, so I did mention that we have gone beyond um, uh, just CS extent. Um, so uh, one of the things we forecast is CIS probability. And here I'm show you the um, uh, CIS probability is, is simply a probabilistic forecast whether a grid cell has CIS in September or doesn't have CIS. And if you run an ensemble, this is just a probability across that uh, ensemble. Um, and uh, so the, these are the kind of uh, uh, spatial figures that um, different contributions uh, contributors send us. And this is from J June, 2021, and on, in black, I show you the um, the observed 2021 um, sea ice edge, and uh, this is this is quite relevant for um, stakeholders. For example, for shipping companies, and I show you shipping tracks in the bottom right. So, uh, for a lot of people that operate in the Arctic, to know, for example, that the Northeast Passage uh, along the Russian coastline, or the Northwest Passage along the Canadian and Alaskan coastline, to know if this uh, open ocean or sea ice is important. And so these sort of forecasts uh, are motivated a little bit by that. And, and you can see that, um, you know, there's a little bit of 
spread in those forecasts, as you might expect, right? If, if the different models give you a spread in total size extent, then the, the spatial forecast is also going to uh, show some spread. Um, and, uh, and I'll show you that here. And by August, there was a little bit of improvement, uh, but it's, it's somewhat limited. Uh, and one of the issues, for example, is that if you go back to June 2021 um, and you look at the multimodal mean forecast here, all the forecasts expected open ocean along the Russian coastline. But if you look at the black uh, contours here, there was actually the Northeast Passage here was actually blocked by sea ice. Um, so, that, so that was missed in June. Although if you look at August, some of the models, for example, CANSIPS version two did forecast sea ice in that region. And so did um, Nikosan or, or the Rasen. Um, but other, other models were just, you know, uh, uh, we're not forecasting that at all. Um, we've, uh, we quant you can quantify the scale of these forecasts by the area weighted average Bryce score. And the, the Bryce score is a very simple metric where you take the, uh, the difference between the forecasted probability and the observed value and, and you square it. Um, and the, the observation is either zero or one, and the, the probability is you know, a number between zero and one. And the closer this um, metric is to zero, the better skill you have. Uh, so this is um, from, from those previous figures I showed, these are the skill across the different models. So there's quite a bit of range. Uh, I have introduced uh, as a benchmark the skill if you use the last um, sort of uh, 14 years to make a climatological forecast, and that's shown in this panel on the right. And uh, the scale of that forecast is this dashed black line. So, uh, you know, again, uh, a few of the models uh, are not beaten this climatological benchmark. Uh, but if you look at the multimodal mean, uh, it does do better uh, than the benchmark. And, and this is a feature we've seen in past years, right? That individual models uh, don't seem to be, be, uh, be doing terribly well, but um, the multimodal mean does, does have skill. All right, so uh, I do briefly want to show the skill in some of the uh, other uh, models or other groups. So this is from the S2S uh, prediction network. Um, this is now a lead time in, in days rather than months. And um, uh, th this, uh, this is uh, the uh, spatial probability score, which is similar to the Briar uh, score I showed earlier. Um, but the main take home message is that uh, this is looking at the skill in five different models compared to climatology, uh, which is in the red, uh, sorry, in the black line here. And, uh, and again, the, these sort of, uh, the, this other group of models show uh, similar uh, aspects that they, they have little skill um, at, uh, at, at the regional um, scales, but that there is a lot of model spread, right? So the ECMWF model does uh, pretty well. It has skill to 40 days, a uh, month and a half. Uh, whereas other models, um, even at lead time zero, uh, they have less skill than the climatology. And uh, this is something that we've also shown. Um, this is a study by, uh, sorry, uh, McGrath et al. This is using the same um, group of models as the previous slide, the S2S. And um, uh, this is the root mean square errors of the total um, sea ice forecast in the, the Pan-Arctic. And, uh, and I, I'm showing you here, rather than a climatology benchmark, the damped anomaly. So if you just, if you just take the, um, the raw forecasts, the absolute forecasts of um, sea ice extent, you can see that the models are doing worse than persistence. Um, but if you look at the, um, the anomaly forecast, and sorry, I forgot to label this. Um, the bottom left is when you just look at the, the uh, you, uh, you look at the, uh, the skill in the anomalies. So you take away the, the model climatology um, and you look at the skill in the anomaly forecast and you can see that they, they do better, but it's still hard to beat this damp persistence. Although the, the, again, the ECMWF model does quite well. And a little bit to develop some kind of physical intuition, I, I wanna show you uh, on the right panel uh, in 2012, that was the, the record low year, and we, there was a period in August uh, that had very fast loss of sea ice extent. Um, and this is from one region in the Arctic, uh, the East Siberian Antarctic Beaufort. So this is along East Siberia and uh, north of the Bering and Alaska. And in black is the observed evolution of sea ice. Uh, there's two different 
uh, observational products here, but um, uh, you, you just need to focus on on, on one or, or the other. But you can see that they, basically they both agree, showing this very rapid loss of sea ice extent. And then uh, these forecasts, um, how well they did. And you can see that um, some of them, you know, the, the, the dots show the initialization. And you can see that quite often, even just the initialization, the, there's already an error in the forecast, right? And then the evolution, um, uh, this model, the Metro France model, doesn't quite get that loss in sea ice. The ECMWF at the beginning doesn't. So these plumes, these forecasts from before the loss event, they kind of go, um, the, the loss is nothing special. It's kind of climatological, but the forecasts that start maybe halfway through this period, that you, you see this faster loss. So there is a bit of skill there. And, and the UK Met Office um, seems to do quite well for this event actually, but it does have too much loss maybe before, uh, but at least the initialization is, is closer to observations. So, um, so a, a little bit about why is there this gap in, in forecast skill, right? So we have results from the perfect models and they, also, they all say you should have skill at seasonal time scales. Um, and then we're making these real world forecasts in real time and, and we're struggling to get much skill. Um, and this was something documented by Mitch Bushuk, and I show you here the, the anomaly correlation coefficient of uh, uh, forecast in a perfect model, and this is the lead time of three years. And then on the right panel, using the same model to forecast the real world, um, so you can, you can compare these uh, panels directly from um, left to right, and, and you can see how much uh, less skill there is. And so this might be, this is an issue, right? That there's this gap uh, or this difference between the skill we sort of expect and the skill we're finding. Okay, so uh, we know that um, the, the uncertainty in the forecast is from unknown initial conditions or from imperfect model physics. Um, so you could, have, you could have a good model, a model with good physics, but poor observations or poor initial conditions, uh, and that would lead to a, a poor forecast. Uh, or you could have the reverse, you could have really good initial conditions or observations, but poor physics. Um, and then you can obviously have a combination of both. So uh, to understand a little bit um, this for the CIS outlook, we know that um, the mechanisms that drive CIS predictability um, are different in the summer and winter. And in summer, when the CIS edge is going towards the North Pole, uh, what, it, what the sea ice cares about mostly is how thick is the sea ice to the north, because that will affect how quickly or how slowly uh, the, the meltbacks go in. Um, whereas in the winter, it's more how, uh, as the sea ice edge is going south, is, uh, you know, the, the, the predictability comes from knowing how cold is the ocean to the south. And how, how am I doing for time, by the way? Uh, I don't know. If... Uh, I think we still have about 10 minutes about okay right. yeah. perfect thanks um so with this in mind um over the last two years we've invited the CIS outlook models to submit the initial conditions and uh uh and this this is a result so we had um five of them oh, and by the way i should mention that the whole effort of the CIS outlook is voluntary um so we always depend on the on the goodwill of the contributors to submit forecasts. So, you know, we're always playing a game of, you know, because we want to know so much more about these forecasts, but we know that people have limited time and resources. Um, so, you know, we're, we're always very grateful to, to the contributors. But um, so we invited them to submit the initial conditions of the forecasts. And a few of them did uh, both last year in 2020 and 2021. So, what I show you here on the top row are the sea ice uh, concentration initial conditions of uh, five different models. And you can see the dates of the forecast initialization on the, uh, the x-axis. Um, and th these are sea ice concentration from zero to 100%. And on the bottom row, you can see the ice thickness that these forecasts initialize the, um, these models initialize the forecast with on the same dates. And the sea ice thickness is in meters. This was for the July 2020 uh, CIS outlook. And you can see that if you look at the top row, there's pretty good agreement across the different 
forecasts across the different groups for wh where they think the sea ice edge and the sea ice concentration is when they start these forecasts. But if you look at sea ice thickness on the bottom row, uh, some models are quite thick um, and other models are quite thin. And this, this might be quite important, right? If, if, a, if a model starts with either thick or thin sea ice for the summer forecast, because we, we believe that a lot of the skill for the summer forecast comes from the thickness. And uh, so this was in July. Uh, this is in August, uh, a month later. And you can see, uh, you can see a similar tendency, um, uh, again, where they agree in concentration. And th this model here, um, it does look different, but the initialization was a month earlier. Uh, so bear that in mind. And when we calculated, um, wh when we aligned the forecast with the right uh, day of initialization, or if you, if you look at the previous uh, figures or, or the data from the previous figures, and you, you uh, plot it with the day of initialization of each model to look at a consistent comparison, um, if you calculate the sea ice volume, so the sea ice volume, you just integrate sea ice concentration and sea ice thickness, so total sea ice that the models have to start with, you can see there is really big spread across those um, five models, right? So, uh, you know, and, and we, we don't really know the observed value because um, we don't have thickness measurements in the summer. We have them in the winter from satellites, but not in the summer. And I know this is, or well, I think this is something Mitch talked about, uh, this problem that to make forecasts in the summer, we would really, we, you know, to know the sea ice thickness in the summer would be really important. Um, but we, you know, the, the observations are not quite there yet, but uh, you can just see that this, this really big spread across the initial conditions. And um, when you look at a scatter plot, when you compare uh, how much sea ice uh, they had to initialize, which is on, along the x-axis, and what the prediction was that each of those groups made. And, and th this is just five models, so it's a very small sample size. But you can see that there's, um, there seems to be a relationship, uh, not surprisingly, that the forecasts that um, the lower forecasts, so this, these are, uh, for example, GFDL had a forecast of 3.2 uh, million square kilometers in early July. Uh, that was the one that had less sea ice to, in the initialization. Um, so we believe that this is, this is a source of uh, forecast error and also to, it helps explain a little bit the, the range, you know, why, why the forecasts are so different across different models. Um, but we also believe that model physics are important. And a few years ago, we made an experiment uh, where we invited the models that contribute to the CS Outlook to make a forecast where they all started on May 1st with the same initial uh, sea ice thickness. And this is shown in, in this figure on the top left. So this is a, a forecast of 2015. And these are eight different models. And they all start with the same sea ice thickness in the Arctic. And you can see by September, there's this really big spread across different forecasts. Um, however, they, we also ran a second forecast where they, uh, the models used a climatological sea ice thickness. And so you can make an anomaly forecast. So um, uh, you ask, uh, oh, and by the way, the, in black is the observations. And there, there were times where none of the models actually forecast the, the right observations that year in this experiment. But um, um, if you take the anomaly forecast, so you sort of, uh, in this way, you, you bias correct in the forecast, you can see that the models now agree much better with each other. And uh, you can quantify this um, with the, uh, the spread across the different forecasts. Uh, so if you look at uh, the top left panel uh, and you calculate the standard deviation across all those forecasts, um, you get the red line. And in the bottom left, this red line becomes a light red line. So, so the uncertainty goes down by about an order of magnitude from about 1 million square kilometers to 0.1. Uh, the black lines, just the, that's just the kind of the, the growth in each ensemble. So that's just kind of irreducible um, kind of uh, error in the forecast from, from chaos, uh, right? From, um, from the butterfly effect um, and um, but so, so this, uh, the result from this is, is that it's, it's important knowing how to bias correct uh, the forecasts of, of CS. Uh, and then finally, um, a little bit maybe of uh, uh, 
uh, you know, something uh, that Mitch Bushwick and myself have been thinking about is going back to those results from the perfect models. Uh, since we've used them a little bit as motivation for these uh, seasonal forecasts, is to think, uh, are, they, are they biased in how predictable they are? And we did a, a study a couple of years ago uh, where we looked at CIMIT 5 and some other GCMs that have been used to study sea ice predictability. And we found that they are more persistent than observations, right? So uh, what I show you on the, in, in this figure, uh, each value is the um, uh, for model is how uh, the year to year correlation in the September sea ice extent and also in the March sea ice extent. So summer to summer along the y axis and winter to winter along the x axis. So the higher the value, uh, the more persistent that model is, right? So, so if you think about that time series of sea ice extent, it means that it, it sort of has more low frequency. Um, and generally that, generally, that means higher predictability. But if you plot the observations, uh, which is this uh, data point here, uh, those, those persistence values um, are less strong. So, you know, it's, it's maybe some indication that maybe also the GCMs, that they think there's too much predictability compared to, to the real world. Um, so I want to show, uh, just leave this up. Um, and um, maybe I, I might, might be, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll let you read it and uh, I'll open the, the floor for questions. So uh, thanks so much for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adful, for this presentation. It was really interesting. And you gave us a very good overview of, of the challenges. Um, so I'll, I'll start the Q&A session. I see that there's a, there's a question in the chat from um, Yulia Selimanova. Uh, she's asking, how does um, internal variability contribute to total uncertainty in CIS extent projections? Um, so, um... That that's not, so uh, that depends a little bit on the time scale. Um, so, for short time scales like for a seasonal forecast, um, internal variability is is a really big source of sort of a forecast error, right? And um, for example, if uh, for these forecasts that we start say in June of September, um, we believe that the skill comes from say sea ice thickness. Or maybe the ocean, because because they change pretty slowly. Uh, but there's a lot of internal variability in in the atmosphere, right? So uh, knowing is it going to be a cool summer or is it going to be a warm summer, uh, that affects the sea ice and how much sea ice you have in September. And there doesn't seem to be much evidence that there's any skill or, or much skill of forecasting uh, summer the average summer weather. At seasonal timescales. Um, so internal variability plays a, a really big role. And I, I, I want to, that's a little bit, I, I know I went a little bit fast, uh, but in this, uh, in this slide, uh, you can think of internal variability as quantified by the chaotic error growth. Um, uh, so this black time series, uh, and this is in, sorry, uh, not quite, I, just, I think this is in square meters, but if you, this is basically, you can think of this as, this is one million square kilometers. Um, sorry about the units here. Um, so it's a, up to almost half a million square kilometers uh, from a May 1st forecast. So basically um, how wide each of these forecasts, so if you look at each colored uh, time series, that's each individual model. So how big that ensemble becomes, um, that is driven by this internal variability uh, that you can't forecast uh, on May 1st, right? It's, it's, it's just chaotic error growth. Um, so it's, 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 you know, internal variability is what's limiting your skill um, uh, for these forecasts. Uh, for the decadal uh, forecast, so, you know, knowing what might be the CIs in 2040, 2050, uh, we believe the internal variability should have a much smaller contribution, right? And and the um, uh, the answer to that question of you know what is what's going to be the average sea ice in ten or twenty years from now, uh, that should be more a result of um, uh, the radiative forcing, right? So climate change, uh, how much climate change we expect, and also what the sensitivity of sea ice to that climate change. So I, I don't know. If, 
uh, that answered your question. So it's kind of a long answer, but it, it does depend a little bit the the time scales uh, that you're thinking about. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. We have more questions coming. There's a question from Paul Rett, um, who's asking, where does one draw the line between a skill that is not acceptable and one that it, that is, or between when models are in agreement and when they're not? Um, that's a really good question and, um, and, and a hard question. Um, so we've been, the, how this whole effort of the CIS outlook started, uh, it was mostly because of the science behind to learn uh, about is the can we have skill at these time scales? Um, what are the physics that might drive these forecasts? So we were very careful. I, I wasn't part of this in 2008. I, I, I became part of the team in 2013, but I remember being told that in 2008, they were very careful not to call this an operational forecast, right? This is research. Um, so we, we don't use the word operational, uh, we maybe prefer real time um, forecasts. Um, but we do know that some people, some stakeholders look at our website and maybe use some of that information. Um, so I think the answer to that question depends, uh, it depends on the stakeholder. It depends a little bit also on, on the, uh, on the purpose of why you're making that forecast and and maybe i'm uh maybe i'm giving you like a politician's answer but uh you know we um you know the way we see this effort is um you know we, we're providing a like a forum for the community to to share this and and we you know we have annual webinars and and so we've developed quite a network where you know different contributions will or, or different groups will talk to each other and so it's, you know, I think we're learning a lot, even as you say, yeah, the skill is quite limited. So, um, you know, that, that might be a little disappointing, but, um, but, uh, but, you know, that you have to start somewhere. And, and uh, I think we're learning a lot about how these forecasts, you, you know, um, what, what's limiting them and, and how we might improve them. Thank you. And thank you, Paul, for your question. Um, the next question is from Constantin um, Ardiluz, sorry about my pronunciation, um, who's saying, um, excellent talk, and he's asking if you take into account the seasonal forecasts from the Copernicus multi-model for the CIS outlook, so that includes, includes ECMWF, UK, Met Office, Media France, CMCC, and so on. Um, not, not myself individually, but I, th I think um, a lot of those Focus. I love those models you just mentioned. Are part of the S2S. Um, so the, uh, those are the results. Um, I know that in um, uh, Zampieri et al. Um, uh, you know, the, they. Uh, I think there's an overlap between the Copernicus and and the S2S models. Um, but um, uh, something also that we haven't done in the CI outlook. We haven't done it yet, but we want to do it. Is we want to quantify the skill in each single model because um, we you know we sort of expect that the skill is not going to be the same for every model some models are going to be better than others and um, um, but we haven't documented that yet and also we don't make a weight uh, a skill weighted uh, multi-model forecast right so if you know that some models are better than other models you can weigh those forecasts more than the other forecasts, like give them give them a bigger weight when you make a multimodal forecast, and that should have better skill. Uh, so we haven't done that yet. Um, but uh, yeah, but I'd I'd love to learn more about to the Copernicus effort. So maybe we can chat offline uh, more later. Okay, thank you. So um, we have about five minutes left. So if there's more questions coming, I think we still have time. Um, in the meantime, maybe I can ask you a question, and um, it's more of a curiosity. I was wondering, so you showed us quite early in your presentation the plot where you were showing um, observed CS extent in September against the predictions. And the year, yes, this one. So the year 2012 is, is obviously very striking. And, and then I think you showed, you showed us in, a, in another plot that was summer of 2012. So if I remember, um, well, that's when we had the um, cyclone in, in the Arctic. Yes. 
So I was wondering, um, is the nature of the event that is causing this CIS anomaly um, important in how the, the, the models perform? Uh, that, that's a really good question, right? And when you think about these extreme years, um, the sort of um, you can think of you can think of both uh, predictable extreme years and unpredictable extreme years, and and by that I mean that some extreme years or some extreme September's might be because um, there was very thin sea ice in the spring, right, or a lot of the sea ice in the winter got exported out of the Arctic because of the Arctic Oscillation or the winds, and you went into spring with a very thin sea ice cover. And, and because of that, you ended up with very little sea ice in September. And, and that would be predictable in, in early summer or late spring, because you would know or you should know that there's very little sea ice uh, or thin sea ice, right? So um, in a way, that'd be predictable. And then you can have the opposite where maybe your sea ice is relatively sort of normal or close to climatology in the spring, and you have a very extreme summer atmosphere, right? Like very warm uh, year or, or very cold. Um, and that most likely would not be predictable at the seasonal timescales, because uh, we don't think, or, or there isn't really any evidence or much evidence that the atmosphere um, is, is predictable at these monthly timescales. Um, at least in the Arctic. Um, and for 2012, um, you know, you can see that none of uh, none of the forecasts, right? Like, I mean, the, the forecast was the same as the previous year, as 2011 here. And and yeah, I think uh, what happened in 2012 is that the, the atmospheric conditions were pretty extreme that summer. Now, there has been quite a bit of uh, discussion about the cyclone, that really big cyclone in August um, that led to that very fast loss of sea ice extent, which I showed later in that regional uh, plot. Um, so yeah, so, so there has been a, like, a, yeah, you know, some people have said, oh, well, you know, that was not predictable. So you couldn't predict that there was this really big cyclone that would lead to this extreme sea ice loss. Um, but there, 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 is, there have been some other studies that have shown that even without the sea ice cyclone, um, 2012 would have been a really low year. Um, so, you know, it's, it's still uh, up some, somewhat of a debate. Um, but um, yeah, yeah these, these are exactly kind of the um, um, sort of, the, you know, the things that we're thinking about in the community. Uh, but I, I do know, I'm pretty sure that um, uh, Mitch in his talk showed a little bit that in, in his um, forecasting system, that uh, these extreme years, uh, they do have skill like a month before or two months before, maybe not three or four months before, but you know, I think the answer is a little bit of both, right? That the, there, there are some sort of very extreme weather events, like a strong cyclone, but uh, there's also a precondition in, you know, of like thinner sea ice from, from the spring. But it's, yeah, it's, it's um, again, it's, it's, a, it's a good and hard question. Thank you, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, we have one more question from Simona Massina, um, head of the Ocean Modeling and Data Simulation Division here at SMCC. She's, um, she says, uh, thank you, excellent talk. And she's asking if you can comment on the lack of thickness observations in summer. So why this happens and if there's any plan, for example, satellite missions or yeah. other plan to um, Yeah, so right now, um, there's a couple uh, satellites that measure, they don't measure sea ice thickness directly, they measure the freeboard, uh, so how far above the sea level the top of the sea ice is. Uh, so there's Cryosat, uh, which is the European, um, and that's a radar satellite, and then there's ISAT2, and that's the American, that's a, a laser or LIDAR satellite. Um, and they, they give us uh, pretty decent estimates of sea ice thickness. Uh, but only when the surface of the sea ice is, is below um, melting, like when, when it's frozen. And there's a problem with the, um, with the retrieval, with the satellite, uh, how they observe that surface when it's melting. 
so as soon as you go into the melt season uh, in like June, in, in sort of mid-May, late May, so once, once the sea ice or all the snow on the sea ice starts to melt, uh, the quality of the, the retrievals from the satellite deteriorates. And uh, this is not, uh, I'm not a sort of observationalist or an expert in the, in the actual satellite retrievals, but speaking to colleagues that are, it's, it's a problem that, you know, we, we've had for many years and, and that I know quite a few people are working on. Uh, but maybe I can show you, um, I, I had some extra slides here at the end about sea ice thickness. Um, so uh, uh, this is, for example, um, an, an estimate of the sea ice thickness anomaly in April, 20, 000, uh, in April 2017. Uh, so this is during the time period or the end, the end of the winter season when we still have uh, decent uh, ice thickness observations or from these satellites. And, and there's still a little bit of uncertainty, right? So the top row, these are three different algorithms. So from three different um, uh, groups that, um, that use the satellite data and then apply their own algorithms. And you can see that there is some consistency, uh, you know, this kind of uh, negative anomalies north of the Canadian Arctic, Arctic archipelago and positive anomalies sort of along uh, the kind of 180 or the kind of this region just, um, uh, uh, I guess, I guess, it's, well, uh, along the 180 uh, east uh, longitude um, of the North Pole here. Uh, but the, the magnitudes are a little different. Uh, so there is, you know, still even in the cold season, some uncertainty, but yeah, so, so that is a little bit of a holy grail of both the observations and the forecasting community that we know if, if we could have uh, like a spatial thickness, sea ice thickness observations in, in like June uh, or early July, that we, we expect that our skill would be quite a bit better, um, but we, you know, we, we don't have those um, observations yet, but I, I know it's, it's like an active area of research. Okay, thank you. So I think we, um, we can probably finish now. It's um, six o'clock, unless anybody has any quick question. Um, if not, we can just uh, conclude here and, oh, there's actually, oh, okay. <laughs> it's just Timo now saying thanks. So that was another question. So um, thank you very much, uh, Edward. This was an excellent talk. So thank you and um, see you soon. Thanks, uh, yeah, thanks for uh, thanks thank everyone. You.